I'm Ann Charles. I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Keith Ghostland, and this is All Things LGBTQ. We are taping on Tuesday, October 8th, and guess what? This is our third anniversary. <laughs> so now that we have your attention, <laughs> and maybe some headlines. I do. I have so many headlines, I can't even begin. Um, but I will. Same-sex marriage in Taiwan, 1,827 marriages and oh 34 goodness. divorces. Local man fighting for recognition of same-sex marriage with Taiwanese resident. So we have two Taiwan stories. I have news from Europe involving um, the UK, Ireland, and Switzerland. Russian court blocks major LGBT online groups. LGBT plus film funding row lands Brazil minister in court. And uh, Brazil artists fear that LGBT shows are doomed under Jair Bolsonaro. Far-right activists storm LGBT film screening in Budapest. Ghanaians fight satanic sexuality education program. Australia Ooh. Post, and here is a, a, this involves a visual. Australia Post releases marriage equality stamps. Let me show you a picture of them right now. They, uh, the people pictured are Beck and Paula from Melbourne and David and Nick from Sydney. So that's in honor of the second anniversary of same-sex marriage in Australia. <coughs> Polish gay pride marchers push past violent counter-protest in Lublin. Russian gay couple with adopted children, which whom I've mentioned last time they were driven right. out of Moscow, they're seeking asylum in the U.S. So I have a picture before you now of them, Andrei Vaganov and Evgeny Yurofev. Yurofev. Uh, that's their picture. Uh, they're already in the U.S., but they're seeking formal asylum. Uh, French lawmakers approve IVF for lesbians and single women, and that's caused a huge lot of protests and controversy. Beirut Pride organizers say clerics forced cancellation of opening concert. And finally, in this long list of headlines, Mariela Castro banned from traveling to the U.S. So I'll be able to tell you more about some of these stories, Anon. All right. On to national news. We, of course, have some information which we're going to talk about a little bit um, about the Supreme Court and the decisions today. So we'll chat about the that. The arguments today. Yeah. Well, in the, I guess there's been arguments already, and it was only the first day, wasn't it? <clears throat> May I ask you a question? Yeah. When's the verdict going to come out? I there, think they argue months. it for a long time. But okay. You know. They're the arguing the, and uh, table it, right? right? The oral presentations occur today. They will ne and they get the opportunity to ask the people from both perspectives, saying, "Okay, convince me why your I interpretation should, yeah. is correct." Now they go behind closed doors and have the pillow fight. And they fight and argue, yeah. which they I guess they were doing quite publicly today. I didn't get a chance to really read up on, on it, but I guess there was quite a quite a lot of fighting amongst the uh, judges. Yeah. yeah, fast so, breaking news. Yeah. So anyway, on to Judge Kills, conversion therapy ban for minors in Florida. Uh, Gerald Bostock didn't think he'd be fired because he joined a gay softball league. Notorious homophobic Rick Perry is out as energy secretary. The former Texas governor spent the last few years trying to cut funding for re renewable energy yeah. while boosting oil and coal. Pastor prays to cleanse the church after the appearance of an LGBTQ speaker. The preacher in Colorado apologized to his congregation for the fact that the LGBT community there was there despite his efforts to shut the speaker down, and he led a prayer to cleanse the church. So. Mm. 
And Ben Carson is at it again with his transphobic remarks. Um, in September, he voiced concern over big hairy men. In the bathroom? No, entering women's shelters. Oh, sorry. Carson, <laughs> who has a history of homophobia, goes beyond <laughs> offensive, and his behavior is simply unacceptable. Uh, a federal grand jury indicts Ed Buck. We'll have more about that. <clears throat> and uh, Florida Realtor has a transphobic Facebook post. Remax in downtown Fort Myers has since apologized for its Facebook post, but the original post said, please, all real estate agents, take the time to make sure that you're showing homes to Jeff, who you're sending, who you're uh, selling your houses to. Is it Jethreen or Jethro? So that was Pete Buttigieg raised nearly $2 million, which will assure him a place uh, in the debate uh, stage. Two black lesbian authors discuss writing life and loss. Um, Uber and Lyft drivers are the first national transgender vil visibility march. It's 3,000 people in D.C. Richard Blanco, gay inaugural poet, D.C. police on Friday announced they have arrested a third juvenile uh, male implicated in the August 2nd assault and robbery of a transgender woman at a gas station. And um, Elaine DeGeneres. Ellen. Oh, Ellen <laughs> DeGeneres, right, was seen hanging out with George W. Bush at the Dallas Cowboys football game. And she's gotten a little pushback about that but she insists that she should be able to see whoever she wants, and kindness is always important. So. Can I ask you a question about yeah. one of your, the Lyft and Uber driver headline? Yeah. Can you explain that? Well, I will when I tell the story. But I'm confused by the very headline. <laughs> you are? Well, <clears throat> they did this. She didn't have the coffee, you did. I know. <laughs> they had, um, They had this experiment, which these two young men, um, did prof uh, phony profiles of gay people and black people and to see how often they were ditched. So. Wonderful. Uh, oh, see, now that's very clear. Thank you. You're welcome. This is like you know, the Black Like Me experiment <laughs> right. in, in our youth. But. Yeah. So, it's not often, but looking for a job? Maybe you would like to be a program and volunteer coordinator in Brattleboro. I need cough. What? <laughs> Looking for a job. Do, I'll write your application down now. Out in the open. LGBTQ plus organization in Brattleboro committed to rural LGBTQ community building. Programs and volunteer coordinator. We are looking for someone who can excel in varied areas like writing, public speaking, collaborating with groups of people who are in different locations, and successfully supporting volunteers while holding our organizational values central. We are looking for someone who can meet multiple co-occurring deadlines and is comfortable working with the close-knit team. We prefer someone who has two to three years of relevant experience. This job is posted in the $30,000 range, which is not bad for Vermont, with benefits. Oh. If you're interested, please look at Out in the Opens website. So trivia, before I forget it this week, <laughs> 1994 Out in the Mountains. Front page article was about preparing for the Vermont Coalition for Lesbian and Gay Rights Queer Town Meeting. And associated with that, they had a critique of the best and worst of queer Vermont. Mm. Two categories, pick which one, ever one you would like to guess. Best political organizer, best social organizations. Looking at some headlines, Toronto. Remember there was a pushback when Chick-fil-A wanted to mm -hmm. reach out into the international market? Well, the, apparently that happy straight pride in Boston was trying to find its way to Toronto 
with the Freedom March in Prayer, so, yeah. sponsored by Christ Forgiveness Ministries. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. I know. And they were attempting to march through the center of Toronto's gay village, <coughs> Wellesley and Church Streets. They kind of met a pushback by the Unite for Love rally, which may have included the mayor <laughs> speaking out. They only made it several streets and were stopped police had to create a barricade between <laughs> love and hate and civil rights are for Christians too. Oh. And Zach had some pictures that hopefully he was showing while we were talking <laughs> about this. And don't forget, October 21st is the Canadian elections. We need to be watching this really closely because some of us may be looking for immigration rights. Was that a barricade of bicycles? I seem to oh. recall seeing a picture of that. There were series of things trying to block the way. Bicycles may have been something that had been employed at one point. Every, it's, and literally every couple of streets, they had to stop <laughs> because they couldn't just, they just couldn't go any further. What a shame. There, <laughs> yeah. The FDA has approved the second, and this is only the second, prophylactic treatment for the transmission of HIV, mm -hmm. PrEP. Um, Chuvada was the one that had been approved. Gilead was the company that developed it and has been selling it. They're also putting out the second one, which is Discovy, it has less side effects. So they're Good. hoping it will be more desirable because the patent on Truvada expires within the year, so generic forms will be better. And wouldn't you like to take this one, which is kinder to your system? And is under pattern. And what was brought out by Ocasia at congressional hearing with the pharmacy company testifying is, why do both of these medications currently cost approximately two thousand yeah. dollars per month when in, when in Australia the monthly cost is between eight and forty dollars and again Linda as Linda said we're going to talk about that Supreme Court case and then I want to spend some time talking about the alliances supported community forums, and there is one that people will be getting notices via the Rainbow Umbrella Organization, Montpelier, Wednesday, October 3rd, 6 o'clock, 30th, October 30th, 6 o'clock at the Montpelier Senior Center. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the legislation that might be discussed. This is the LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont. Yes, that is correct. Yep. Okay. I'm all into context these days. <laughs> we <May> got letters, <coughs> we're going to use them all. <laughs> That's right. All right, may I begin sure. my little segment involving Taiwan? And, and, so, and so Linda blows the horn. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, she's got it ready. She's hard. I do. Okay. Uh, Same-sex marriage registrations near... 2,000 in the first three months in Taiwan that same-sex marriage has been legalized. Um, another 34 people in the three months have already terminated their marriages. Um, <coughs> despite the prog progress made, same-sex marriages between Taiwanese nationals and foreigners may still be restricted by the laws of the latter's countries as same-sex marriage must be legal in both countries for a union to be recognized by law. And leading into that, a local man um, has filed for recognition of same-sex marriage with a Taiwanese resident. Uh, the broad, a broadcaster at Public Television Service, China's National Day, uh, reported that a Macau resident and his Taiwanese partner went to the civil registry 
in Hinshu and requested for their union to be officialized. Then, of course, it was rejected. And if I, I have a picture before you now of the two complainants. Um, in May, I had already remarked there would be instances where local residents were not allowed to marry Taiwanese residents, uh, and it has occurred. The couple has made a legal appeal to reverse the decision with the head of the local LGBT rights group saying the two Taiwanese organizations are helping legal procedures, although Rainbow Macau is not directly providing assistance to the local resident, it would keep it's going to keep monitoring the situation. According to the Taiwanese media report, the couple has been dating for four years with local resident, the local resident having quit his job as a psychiatrist to move to Taiwan two years ago to live with his partner. So let's wish them luck with that. Um, I do have some AIDS news, um, bad news from the UK. Um, the HIV diagnosis for 15 men uh, occurred while they were waiting for a drug. The National Health Service, at least 15 people in England have tested HIV positive while waiting to get a place on the trial for a pill which prevents the disease. Mm -hmm. Pre-PrEP is a daily tablet which can stop a person from getting HIV, with this we know. England is the only place in the UK where places on a trial access the drug through National Health Service. It's the only place where the access is restricted. Um, the Department of Health said plans are underway for routine commissioning when the trial ends next year. PrEP is freely avail available for high-risk patients in Scotland, and the British HIV Association, which represents healthcare professionals involved in the treatment and care of people with HIV, is calling for the same in England. Why are they doing that? Places are limited, and some yeah. clinics have had to close their lists but there are still places available around England. Ha. Huh. Um, sexual health consultants say the trial is particularly useful for people who can't afford PrEP privately. And among the 15 <coughs> cases of the people acquiring HIV while, for, while waiting for trial places, several people were on low incomes and couldn't afford the drug otherwise. Yeah. All 15 were tested and found to be HIV negative when they were assessed for a place on the trial. Um, but then while they were waiting, de uh, developed an HIV positive diagnosis. When I was doing the research on what it cost here in America, in the UK, the comparable treatment was around $1,300 a month. Wow. So mm -hmm. there's still a prohibitive factor involved. Here, uh, to elaborate, the cost of medicines for an HIV-positive patient ranges from 100 pounds a month to 500 pounds a month and needs to be provided for the rest of the person's life. Okay. The BBC has learned that PrEP, PrEP costs the NHS, the National Health Service, about 11 pounds per person per month. Privately funded PrEP starts at about 30 pounds a month. Um, the tension in funding is very quickly says, uh, is <coughs> tricky, says Dr. Laura Waters, the British HIV Association chairwoman, and I have picked a picture of her now before you. It's not straightforward, but the reality is that NHS, National Health Service England, are funding the drug through the trial, but it's local authorities that fund sexual health clinics. When the impact trial started, we had only branded products available. Now it's available in the unbranded generic version, which is much, much less expensive. Oh. But the reality of creating more sexual health appointments when our funding has been cut is a very big challenge. Um, this is terrible. Yeah, it is. In contrast, in Ireland, nine in 10 gay and bisexual men living with HIV are on treatment and cannot transmit the virus. Um, they, they all, they, almost all of them have an undetectable viral load. More than 2,000 gay, bisexual, and men, 
gay, bisexual, and men who have sex with men responded to an online survey, survey and this was discovered. So Ireland is in better shape. Speaking of disappointments in Europe, going back to England, um, counselors, advocates criticized the Swiss government's refusal to ban gay conversion therapy. Just a minute, it's going to be short. Um, <laughs> <laughs> despite gay conversion therapy being heavily criticized, uh, Switzerland, uh, the Federal Council in Switzerland has stated that it opposes a ban on conversion therapy, arguing that the current laws are sufficient to protect people from all types of alternative therapies. Uh, Lucas Ott from Basel told uh, the Basel newspaper that banning conversion therapy would send an important message throughout the country. Why don't they do it? Okay. Why don't they? That's enough for me right now. All right. Now we have a judge who kills therapy ban for minors in Tampa, Florida, because he's convinced, he's not convinced that the practice is harmful. He killed the for children. conversion therapy ban? Yes. The judge said the ban may interfere with parents' rights to privacy <coughs> and parental rights to choose health care for their children. The challenge to the city ban came from Robert Vazo, a marriage and family counselor, and New Hearts Outreach, a Christian ministry. The plaintiffs were represented by our friends at the Liberty Council, oh. an anti-LGBT nonprofit. How do I even get nonprofit status? <clears throat> um, I've, I've seen the paperwork. I, yeah. yeah. They claim they're based on the religious freedom principle. Yeah, I, Conversion therapy, well, yeah. they used to just lock us away in institutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now they drive us crazy and then into... Um, Gerald well, Bostock didn't think he'd get fired because he joined a gay softball league, but it cost him his job. He was a child welfare service coordinator assigned to juvenile court in Clayton County, Georgia. He also directed an award-winning program for 10 years within the agency he worked. He was fired, he alleges, when county officials accused him of mismanaging money despite his perfect working record. Pamela Collin, a professor at Stanford Law, will represent his case, will take his case to the Supreme Court. Which is, what they, which is what they heard today. Mm. Right. And the federal grand jury indicts Ed Buck. Ed Buck, as we know, well, he was indicted in the meth-related deaths of gay men. He's a huge Democratic donor and is now charged with providing drugs that led to the deaths of Jamal Moore and Timothy Dean. And he could spend the rest of his life in prison. Prosecutors say the 65-year-old targeted vulnerable individuals who were destitute, homeless, or struggling with addiction in order to exploit them. Uh, and uh, and they were also and because young. of the power, right? No, they were young men of color. Right. Young so men he of didn't color. Think yep. Anyone would and care. we've been reporting on <coughs> this for a long time. And yeah. well, I'm fine. I'm glad he is finally um, being indicted. But continued injecting men with meth as part of his sexual gratification. Three other men were drugged, but they didn't die. <coughs> Two black lesbian authors discuss writing, life, and loss. Sarah M. Brown and Nicole, Nicole e. Dennis Ben, share their take on everything from colorism to classism. Ms. Brown is the author of The Yellow House and author uh, of a vital reframing of New Orleans. The Yellow House finds an epic, fascinating, empathetic history of New Orleans <coughs> within the life of one woman, but her family, home, and the place she grew up. Nicole Dennis Ben and her award winning novel, Here Comes the Sun, which we read uh -huh, in our was lesbian named book group. The best Best book of the year by the New York Times. It was so, really good. Yeah, it was very so, good. So a future interview might be with Professor Charles and poet Quinlan about the difference between writing a literary review versus writing poetry. 
academia versus, yeah. <laughs> Well, that could be interesting. <laughs> be thinking about it. Um, and, oh, and I have a clip. There are, is two movies in the New York Film Festival uh, to watch out for. Portrait of a Lady on Fire. The writer-director is Celine Scalama. Portrait of a Lady, um, it was written uh, and born to be a movie about transgender surgeries directed by Tania Cipriano. So the first clip is Portrait of a Lady on Fire. So um, hopefully they will be coming to our area soon. Are you going to show a second clip or just one? No, I, they only had one clip. So. Okay. Well, and I was going to ask you on fire. we were going to have access to. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's in and, New York now, huh? Yeah, it's in New York now. Um, and it's running till the end of October, so if you're in New York, go see it. And if not, I hoping it shows up on other venues um, in our area. Votre mère est d'accord pour que vous sortiez seul demain. Vous serez libre. Être libre, c'est être seul. Vous ne croyez pas Je vous dirai demain. Je vais aller à la messe. Vous voulez communier Je veux entendre de la musique. L'orgue, c'est beau, mais c'est la musique des morts. C'est la seule que je connaisse. Vous n'avez jamais entendu un orchestre Non. Oui. Racontez-moi. Je n'ai pas facile de raconter la musique. Oh, Richard Blanco, which people might know, was the gay inaugural poet for Obama. And he pens an anthem for Latinx lives. He was commissioned by USA Today to write a poem that reflects on the El Paso shootings. He wrote the new national anthem to mark the two-month anniversary of El Paso shooting and the beginning of Hispanic Heritage Month. The poem is The U.S. of Us, and is published in both English and Spanish. So. All righty. All righty. So LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont <coughs> is working in collaboration with local organizations to sponsor open forums in Montpelier, coordinating with Rainbow Umbrella St. Johnsbury with the group to whose picnic you yes, attended right. social group, Brattleboro out in the open, Bennington, Queer Connect, Burlington is going to be sponsored by the Pride Center, and in Rutland it's being sponsored by Rutland LGBTQ+. Is this the new group? The, in Rutland? Yeah. Uh, new as in they've been around for a year and a half and the rest of us it's just know about it. pay attention <laughs> and they do... <laughs> the third Sunday of each month, they do this social gathering at a local restaurant. Uh -huh. Come together for brunch, just talk with each other. The intent of these forums is for the people who have been going to the state house and working with state government to truly be advocates and reflect the needs of the community not what it is that our community organizations believe we should be doing, but what do you need for support living your life? 
as an openly LGBTQ plus Vermonter. So some of the things that might come up in conversation is, and these are pieces of legislation that were still pending after last year, well, when the session ended this mm -hmm. May. H207, which Montpelier is particularly going to be interested in because this is the non-citizen voting in city elections. Right. And it passed the House, but didn't make it to the Senate before the crossover date. So it's the center's pro protocol that we're not taking it up. It needs to wait for the next year. So it most likely will be assigned to government operations. Anthony Polina sits okay. on government operations. What I think is going to be my personal opinion, the issue that really should be pushed is Constitutional Amendment 4 to amend the Vermont Constitution so every Vermonter enjoys equal treatment and respect under the law. And it will take all of the suspect classes mm -hmm. that for which we have given protection <coughs> in anti-non-discrimination legislation and elevate it to the constitutional level which means regardless of what the U.S. Supreme Court does, you would be protected here because the list includes race, ethnicity, sex, religion, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or national origin. It is currently sitting in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Well, let's and push it forward. Well, there's no, there are no Washington County Senators right. on Judiciary, so it would be... Let's talk minimum wage and paid family leave. There were two proposals. As people may recall, when they adjourned in May, the Senate sent their concurrent with the House amendment after the House had adjourned for the year. So as soon as they get back in January, these will probably be two of the bills that will be brought up within very short time. We want to be watching paid family leave because the legislature crafted their own bill, but the governor has the twin state voluntary family and medical leave proposal, the Scott Sununu bill, that they're going to be pushing. And I have a copy from the administration of what they say their bill does, so we will have it available to hand out to people. Good. So you can see exactly what it is that's being proposed. The other thing, very quickly, two things. One is S-169, which is a firearms procedures bill. This is the bill that would include the 24-hour waiting period on the purchase of a handgun. Isn't that what Scott vetoed? Bingo. Mm -hmm. However, he vetoed the bill after the session had adjourned, so one of their first actions could be to try to do a vote to override the veto. Oh, good. Oh, or good. they might look at, okay, can we come up with some compromise language and reintroduce a bill? Mm -hmm. So if, if gun violence is a concern, as it should be for the LGBTQ plus communities, we're going to be Let's watching this. Do it. And finally, every time we report on another transgender woman of color being murdered, people look at, so what is Vermont doing to ensure that if something similar were to happen here, that someone could not use as their defense, oh, I didn't realize they were transgender, so of course I had to kill her. Mm -hmm. So there are currently eight states that have already enacted a ban on the use of gay and trans panic defenses. Um, Illinois, Hawaii, Connecticut, Maine, Nevada, California, New York, Rhode Island. People here are looking at when is Vermont going to do the Good same. Idea. In committee is um, District of Columbia, New Jersey, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Texas is considering it, New Mexico, Washington, and Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Usually what you find is that the panic defense is used in conjunction with either a diminished capacity, provocation, or a self defense mm -hmm. motivation. Hmm. Okay. And then I want to hear what you need. Well, I'd like to go to some aborted theater activities. First in uh, Brazil under Jair Bolsonaro. Uh. I'd like to show you a picture now of Arthur Ribeiro. 
who is a gay actor in Brazil, um, a state-run theater in uh, Brazil suddenly dropped his LGBT-themed stage show, Gritos, prompting Mr. Roberto to worry if it was over for the company entirely under President Jair Bolsonaro. He said that Caixa Cultural Center in the capital of Brasilia last week canceled his show in which he plays a transgender character. We knew Bolsonaro's arrival in power in January was going to be a dramatic turning point, but even in my worst nightmare, I could not have imagined that it would be so terrible, he said. Wow. I could tell you more about that, but instead let's go on to an aborted production in Beirut, where uh, far-right activist, I'm sorry, in Budapest, the B words, <laughs> Beirut's pride, March was canceled. Right. But uh, here in Budapest, there, uh, there was an LGBT film screening. Uh, it was an anti-bullying film. Uh, it was disrupted by far-right activists. The event at the Aurora Community Center in the Hungarian capital, um, but was disrupted by members of the far-right Our Nation oh. movement. According to Budapest Pride, the nationalist violently pushed into the screening room with banners displaying slogans, LG, stop LGBT propaganda, and zero tolerance. Of course, the police came and failed to remove the anti-LGBT activists. A representative of Budapest Pride said they did not do anything to stop the neo-Nazi group and were just standing silently by and watching. Uh, police officers failed to intervene as the protesters heard, hurled anti-LGBT plus slurs at the participants, but did intervene when a yogurt was poured over one of the banners carried by a far-right activist. We, we need to send some of the people from Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> With their bicycles. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there time for me to talk about the Ghanaian just a little bit, yeah. Okay, there's a program, the Comprehensive Sexuality Education uh, Program has been introduced for primary school children from age four and has sparked agitations by well-placed Ghanaians, including, mm -hmm. of course, church leaders. Beginning next year, pupils in all public schools, including five-year-olds, will be taught CSE and is the uh, Comprehensive sexuality education is called. Uh, the United Nations s says that it was introduced in a bid to empower adolescents and young people to deepen their scope of existing activities to attain comprehensive sexuality education, known as Our Right, Our Lives, Our Future. The CSA is supported by the governments of Sweden and Ireland. It's been implemented in Ghana at Swanee, which is the former name, which is the current name of the former Swaziland, which I just learned. Malawi, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zabwe. It's been implemented there for effective uh, delivery of quality, comprehensive sexuality programs. Of course, um, people are irritated. They are suggesting that this is a gateway to awareness of homosexuality. Our These Christian are, group should be over there soon. Yes, well, the deplorables <laughs> Give them time. have been active. But according to the director of the Ghana Education Service, the CSC will help nurture positive attitudes, open-mindedness, respect for self and others, non-judgmental attitudes, and a sense Good. of responsibility concerning sexual and reproductive health issues. So it's going to Good. stay in Ghana. Good. The executive secretary and spokesperson for the National Coalition for Proper Human Sexual Rights and Family Values, a deplorable, says teaching five-year-olds about sexuality is clearly an LGBTI Recruitment. agenda. And that oh. some texts and not modules in the curriculum that will guide the CSC program in Ghana resonate with LGBT activism.
Right. Gotta All right. go forward. Yes, we'll right. keep an eye on that to see how the deplorables hold up. All right. Talking, so, talking briefly about the um, Supreme Court, mm -hmm. there was a fight uh, among the jurists today, right? Fight is not the correct word. There was Argument, lively de a debate. There was a lively debate. discussion. Yes. There was a difference of legal opinion. <laughs> yeah. The, the the basis of all three cases that were going before the Supreme Court. The sky diver. The funeral home and uh, the social worker. Social worker, right? The, the gay softball team. The lower courts, what they were basing their rulings on, is looking at the Civil Rights Act of, of 1964, Title VII. Right. And would a reasonable person believe that under the definition of sex, when you were looking at what does that mean? that sexual orientation and or gender identity would be a component right. as part of what constitutes sex. Right. So that's what this case is all about, is does the Civil Rights Enforcement Act not by explicit language, but does it implicitly support mm -hmm. non-discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So we'll identity. keep an eye on that and keep you informed. And, as it goes and we knew it was going to be a lively debate. Right. And there's a lot of protesters out there looking really good. Thank you for being there. Um, they were there now, 36 hours in advance. Yeah. Now. We have a very important interview. It took us three years to get this guest. <laughs> but finally we cornered her. Please watch our interview with Ann Charles. Good evening, and it's taken three years. She's finally been cornered. <laughs> she can avoid us no longer. We're going to be interviewing Ann Charles, who you all may think you already know a great deal about her from the last three years of broadcasts, but we're we're going to poke a little deeper. So, you know, as I had said when we were chit-chatting before, you you have already shared that you were originally from Buffalo. You're a Catholic in recovery. Correct. And you have dedicated your life to academia. And starting out in political science and then moving to English and literature. And that's taken you to various places and meeting the lovely Linda, but that's going to be an entirely separate interview. So welcome. Thank you. So political science, what, yes. what was the attraction? It, I started college in 1969 and everything was percolating. I was discovering... In New York. In New York. I was discovering my feminism. Uh, I didn't come out till after my undergraduate time, but I okay. was very excited by Karl Marx and leftist thinking and um, leftist activism that was all um, burgeoning during that period. I was going to say, that's sort of the height of the gay liberation front in New York, and there you were. It Did was, you... Did was, you have an involvement or? No, it was just starting. Okay. Um, and I arrived in September after Stonewall. Okay. And so I, I really didn't have much of a sense, although a friend of mine, I mean, you know, we were all, most of us were heterosexual at that time, and a friend of mine wrote. Or so you thought. Or so we thought, of course. <laughs> and a friend of mine wrote, her, wrote a paper by interviewing Morty Manford. I don't know if you know him. He was a Columbia, an activist at Columbia, Columbia University. Yeah, whose mother started P Flag, and he died young. Um, but it was all very exciting. Another reason I chose political science was that the English department was very stodgy. They wouldn't let you. <laughs> you had to read Spencer and Milton, take courses on all these people, and they wouldn't let you cross list with Columbia. So it was very hidebound that English department. Very so restrained. Yeah. So what did you think you were going to ultimately do with a degree in political science? Exactly. I had no idea. And I remember being at a tea at Barnard with a lot of people who had also majored in political science in a 
poli sci teacher went up to us and said, what are you going to do in, around the circle? We said, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. So. <laughs> it's like my brother who got a degree in anthropology and realized his only marketable job skill was that he could pump gas. So, no, what were you going to say? I was going to say there were um, periods when I wasn't an academic also that were very important to my political and intellectual growth, particularly between my MA and my PhD. I spent six years in Boston, and okay. the reason I moved to Boston was that I wanted to be an open lesbian. I had discovered I was diabetic, and I wanted to have a, a nine-to-five job to test that out. And that was such an exciting period to be a lesbian feminist. I had come out by then. Okay. Um, to be a lesbian feminist. To define yourself as a lesbian feminist, I hope you would come out. Yes. <laughs> I, is this when you were co-editor of The Second Wave? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. The, I've got to say that when I read the brief description of The Second Wave, it reminded me of Common Woman, mm -hmm. which was specifically to talk about real women's issues. Things, things that were truly of importance and not the good housekeeping kind of. Is that what Second exactly. Wave did? Okay. Exactly, sure. Yeah. And you did that for several years? Two years, yes. Okay. And then the magazine, it was sort of on its last legs. It was processing and processing and not publishing. Oh. So, you know, ultimately it folded. But it was, I went to the Women in Print Conference in 1981 where Kitchen Table Women of Color Press was founded. I mean, it was just really electrifying time. I was going to say it was a time when they, we had a sense of incredible possibility. You know, they were, it was the genesis of so many different movements within our communities that I, I think we kind of have lost that, that inspiration, that enthusiasm. I'm also concerned that, I mean, you're talking about second wave sort of imploding upon itself, you know, and looking at what's happening with our alternative journalism and literature now, that we're losing all of those forums. But I don't want to lose touch with the, you found literature, and more Gee. importantly, you found women's literature. And from what you were just relaying about why you didn't do literature in your undergraduate, that all sounded very classic male-based, male-dominated. So how did you find programs that were going to be supportive of what you wanted to study? Well, I went to, I got my MA at Purdue in Indiana, okay. which was my you know, sort of entry into literary studies. And then the Boston period occurred, okay. and I applied to a PhD program, and I deliberately chose it because it was a feminist school. Oh, okay. Um, there were all kinds of high-profile scholars who were working there, including the feminist historian Gerda Lerner, the lesbian, my mentor, Elaine Marks. I mean, these names may not mean much to the general audience. But they had but a real impact on you. Well, yeah, yeah. Although um, when I was in at Madison, they were just starting to work on women's literature as an academic field. So they um, inaugurated Area 5, which was a women's literature program that you could major in. It sounds like going to Arizona and the UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay. It was such a... Uh, okay, you're talking about Madison and, and working on your doctoral thesis, and it's sounding as though by virtue of the, the work you were doing on the dissertation, it was helping to create this whole studies program. Well, I was there at the beginning. Okay. Um, in Madison and also at the University of New Orleans where uh, I moved after I finished my coursework at Madison. Um, all that was just starting. I was the second person in the uh, doctoral program at UW, as we called it, to do my prelims on women's literature. Okay. There was a lesbian ahead of me. Um, she was a year ahead of me. Okay. This is going to be a tricky question. Spending time at Goddard 
during the 70s, that heady time, the Women's and Feminist Studies program was sort of the genesis of a lot of social and political change. Did you find that working in the Women's Studies program at, at these different institutions, it had the same type of impact and influence on that segment of academia? Oh, yeah. Um, okay. But I so should explain that when I was at Barnard, uh -huh. Kate Millett had published Sexual Politics oh. the year before I entered, but women, there was no women's studies at Barnard. So it all developed, it. you know, um, after I graduated. So Barnard was a little, uh, New York was very cutting edge. Barnard was a little slow to catch up, but yeah. now, of course, they're a center of yeah, but we're still not doing so great at recognizing women's study and the contribution of women authors, such as Juna Barnes, who might have been the focus of your doctoral thesis regarding a sapphic revolution? Sapphic modernism. Modernism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Who is she, <laughs> and why should I know who she is? She's a very exciting, I think she's a very wonderful writer. Um, critics have called her most famous book, Nightwood, an underground cult classic. Um, I first okay. read Nightwood when I was during my MA program at Purdue, and the professor was very uh, cutting edge for Purdue. Uh, and he assigned it. Then, when I was in Boston, I reread it in my lesbian book group, which was a wonderful experience. And then, um, when I, I think I read it another time. So when I got to uh, Madison, I, uh, oh, I, I took it. I, she was assigned in the course, but I'd already read her several times. So I began to. I love her work. And she, you know, she was one of the Paris lesbians, okay. an expatriate from the U.S. Um, there was quite the culture there. Oh, I know it. And the she, salon movement that we never got to experience. Before. And she was involved with the Natalie Clifford Barney yeah. um, salon and wrote a short novel. How, how receptive were these academic institutions to the type of work that you wanted to do? the type of study you wanted to explore? They were fine in Madison because the okay. way had been paved by all these feminist scholars who Just before were you. working there now, sure. Okay. And you're still holding on to that literary connection because I understand you write reviews for the Lambda Literary Journal. Lambda Literary Review, View. yes. And that yes. you might be a frequent contributor. Very true. Very okay. true. The, the, looking at her job application, hmm. and, and we'll let you know if you get the position. <laughs> One of the things that, that stood out for me is when you started talking about your sense of political activism, it really starts highlighting after you got to Vermont. Well, there was um, there was a lot going on before there. Okay. Then, um, if I, I think that's why I was asking if the women's studies promoted social and political change on campus, or but go on. Well, um, there was another excellent, rich period of my life was when I taught at the University of New Orleans for 17 okay. years, and there um, I used to say my scholarship is my activism because okay. I rose, I was involved professionally in the national, uh, the Modern Language Association's Gay and Lesbian Caucus. Um, we sponsored panels, including panels like Gay and Lesbian Print Culture, another abiding interest that you and I have talked about. Yes. Um, I was okay. director of the Women's Center. I taught my first lesbian studies course ever, and I think it might have been the first to be offered in Louisiana in the 90s. So your, your teaching in and of itself was an act of political activism? Combined with the scholarship, because okay. my dissertation was titled Sapphic Modernism in the novels of Juna Barnes. So um, it's been an interesting pairing throughout my life, the scholarship and the activism, and I tried to combine them. 
and you have a women's discussion group Correct. that continues to meet to promote that kind of conversation and that discourse from within the women's community because it looked as though you tried to create space for those conversations in places where they didn't already exist. I was part of all of it, but I never, you know, I was a contributor, but not a founder or a, you know. But sometimes you need the foot soldiers who keep it going and actually give it life. So I will that, so that those coming after you, as you've already alluded, have have a clearer path. <coughs> I will say though, an easier one. Uh, I would. I think I was an innovator in New in New Orleans for because I conceived of and proposed the lesbian lit course. I came out to my classes, um, so, and I was the. There was another lesbian on the faculty, but I was the most out, and um, it was curious. There, several things were curious. One was, when I first taught the course, I thought, somebody's going to vandalize my car, I'm going to get oh. in trouble. But the constituency of the first course was um, at least a third heterosexual men. And I was, because they had a sister who was a lesbian or a mother, I mean, it was very interesting. and. A great experience. Somehow their eyes had been opened. <coughs> and in our last 10 seconds, I'm looking forward to what you're going to bring to us in the next three years. Thank you for the time we've shared. I look forward to what comes ahead. That was a good interview. Thank oh, you. that was really good. And, and, and we were just getting going. With, it's I always know. the way with interviews, you know, you just start getting going. We should like have our interviews and then play them like off weeks that we're not on or something. <laughs> That's an idea. You know? If Linda, anyway. <laughs> if Linda Quinlan ever looks at you and says, I have an idea, run from the room. <laughs> and with that... Wait, 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 the trivia what? question. Oh, the trivia question. Yeah, come on, the <laughs> trivia question. Okay, so 1994, best and worst of queer Vermont, Best political organizer, coming from Burlington, Peggy Lures. Wow. Best social organizations, coming out of Burlington, Vermont Gay Social Alternatives, now known as Out in 802, and from Worcester, Vermont, Women of the Woods. Oh, there we go. I remember that. Oh. And so with that, we're going to say resist. Resist. <laughs>